What's going on, everybody? Welcome back into the Frogs Up TCU Sports Podcast. I am Russ Hodges. That is Anthony North. We are back to talk about all things TCU sports. The Frogs picking up a huge win over the weekend at the Carter. 44-11 over BYU. Josh Hoover, the redshirt freshman quarterback. Outstanding performance in his first career start. We have all you need to know recapping the football game against BYU. We have some soccer updates, some volleyball updates and a quick Big 12 recap of the action in week seven of the college football season. We have a birthday boy in the podcast this evening. Anthony, talk about your your birthday celebration with the fam yesterday. Yeah, man, it was pretty low-key. Uh, had, had a nice birthday last night. Thanks for pushing this, and and sorry to all the fans out there that we uh, this is now releasing on, on a Tuesday instead of a Monday morning. We're recording Monday night. Yes, had... Had my birthday. Um, yeah, as an old man, it's a, it's a fun celebration with the family. And we had a good lunch at Fuzzies, which um, actually I was just thinking about what brings back a little bit of nostalgia to playing BYU back when I turned 21. Uh, brought into back in the day, you could like bring in drinks into the Carter. Hmm. And so like I brought one of those fuzzies margaritas into uh into Amon Carter Stadium way back in the day uh taking on BYU for one of one of the most uh enjoyable beatdowns uh of the Mountain West era so it was fun to kind of relive that again this weekend with uh with TCU and BYU also here on my birthday weekend but yeah it was a good time and um you know every everything is we're in fall we're in full October Halloween time so Already the kids are out in, in costumes attending trunk or treats. So I got get some nice Reese's and M&M's and Kit Kats and all that. But uh, Russ, how are things going out there for you? Man, I'll tell you, Friday night, we had a torrential downpour. I was out covering Friday night football. They had senior night here in Rochelle, and it, it did not stop raining all night. I was soaked out there with my camera and my umbrella trying to get whatever action photos I could get from from the football game. And by the end of the night, I was just glad to to get back inside and get my work done and get home. But uh, man, you bring up fuzzies. God, every time I go to fuzzies, I got to get the the steak burrito with the garlic sauce. That that stuff hits different. Every time I go down to Fort Worth, I got to cruise through fuzzies and get that at, at least one time. And on the, on the birthday subject, I'm going to be getting up there as well, hitting that big three zero uh, next May. And that's, I'm preparing for that to be the the last important birthday for for a while, being a, a 29 year old. But um, we're still a ways away from there. Um, but what we aren't a ways away from is TCU football dominating BYU over the weekend, 44 to 11. The final score: Josh Hoover, redshirt freshman, making his first career start for Chandler Morris, who did not play due to his MCL injury. Josh Hoover, Anthony, you called it on the podcast a few days ago during our midweek episode. You said that Josh Hoover was going to have a big game. You said he was going to ball out, and he balled out to the tune of 439 passing yards, four touchdown passes, had a 26-yard run early in the second half to pick up a first down, was talking a little smack to, to some of the BYU defenders. He was talking up his teammates on the sideline, talking to his offensive linemen, talking to his wide receivers and we heard before the game the the praise of his maturity and the way that his teammates and and head coach Sonny Dykes talked about him it was really exciting to see him come out and have a a huge game and TCU dominated this football game from the very first series where Miller Bradford has a pick six on a delayed blitz where Shad Banks comes and forces Keaton Slovis to make a poor throw that winds up being picked off for a touchdown. And that play in that series really set the tone for, for the entire game. And there were a lot of great things for TCU that happened in this ball game. But Anthony, as you watch this game, I, I believe that you were in the stadium. Just describe the, the environment, describe the atmosphere and just what are your biggest takeaways from this game? I think definitely in the building, people were ready for something positive to happen and for that to happen right away. 
uh, the first pass of the game to be intercepted for a touchdown uh, certainly set the tone for the day. And, and the players after the game said as much too, that, you know, on both sides of the field, you could really feel the energy just fully go in the direction of the Horn Frogs and, and the crowd there definitely felt it as well. Um, and yeah, I guess just to speak on Josh Hoover, um, as much as, you know, I thought he would have a good game against this BYU team. Um, I was very surprised with how good a game this was. He was, he was incredible. I mean, um, and, and I guess we can, we can talk to some of what he did, um, and some of what the team did, but I guess the way that, um, folks after the game, including coach Sonny Dykes spoke about his leadership, about how, uh, you know, he is, he is the hardest worker that they were not surprised by this performance that, um, he's the first one in the building and the last one to leave. And as much as that's a cliche that it's true about Josh Hoover and that, uh, you know, that he was the most prepared guy every day, uh, on the whole, uh, across the entire football team. So, um, clearly the, the coaching staff and his teammates have a lot of respect for Josh Hoover and have a lot of appreciation for his skill too. And I mean, TCU put a lot of faith in him right away in this game. First quarter, I think there were four run plays and he had 17 pass attempts. So right away he's thrown fully. They're, they're putting the offense right on his shoulders, right from the start. So, um, you know, I, I think we could talk about all of the, the incredible plays he had, but for him to, I, I think the biggest takeaway aside from his performance himself is he attempts 58 passes, nearly 60 pass attempts in this game, and is basically never touched. Um, mm -hmm. The TCU offensive line and the running backs and pass protection were superb in this game. And I know it's been a uh, one of the negative points for TCU across this season um, that uh, – the offensive line hasn't really gelled together. Um, and it's really shown the cracks of losing a guy like Steve Avila and Alana Lee on, on the front there. Uh, but this game, they, they really put it together. I mean, uh, not just the offensive line though, because Amani Bailey had probably a handful of incredible pass protection blocks. And, you know, he didn't have the biggest game statistically, uh, just 13 carries 61 yards, but, um, he was a huge contributor in that way where several times he's there are free running blitzers about to just tee off on Hoover and, and Bailey's there to, to pick them up and light them up or, or take their knees out. So um, a lot of praise to go around to a lot of places. So wherever you want to take it next, I think there's um, uh, there's plenty to say. Yeah, I think we have to stay on Josh Hoover here for a little bit because he earned some accolades from this performance. He was named the Big 12 Conference Offensive Player of the Week for his performance. He was the pro football focus highest graded quarterback in college football, graded higher than J uh, Jaden Daniels from LSU and some of these other elite quarterbacks that have been around for a while. And I was shocked by this. I mean, I spoke on the podcast a few days ago in our midweek that I thought TCU would come in and try to really establish the run game. I thought TCU would try to protect the quarterback a little bit with him making his first career start. And given what we saw in some of those emergency situations where Hoover came in and, I mean, he's fumbling snaps and throwing bad interceptions, I thought TCU would come in and, and try to protect him a little bit more. But you spoke to how many pass attempts he had early in this game. TCU at one point had 20 pass attempts and only five runs. And I think that was, that's really a combination of BYU's defense was doing little to nothing to stop TCU's air raid offense. But clearly the coaching staff felt confident enough in Josh Hoover to give him a heavy workload throwing the football. And I mean, what a, what a difference a full week of practice makes working with the first team offense because Josh Hoover I understand that it's just one game. I'm not trying to get too far ahead. And I know a lot of frog fans are 
trying to do the same thing, but he did a lot of things in this game that you really want to see from a quarterback playing at a high level. The way that he maneuvered around the pocket, he was working up in the pocket, he was surveying the defense, he was going across the field. The touchdown pass to Warren Thompson Mm -hmm. in the second half was one of the more impressive quarterback plays that I've seen from T.C. Wall year. He takes a snap, he looks right, his first read's not there, works to the middle of the defense, second read's not there, all the way back to the left side of the field, and he throws a laser to Warren Thompson for the touchdown pass. And he was throwing some absolute dimes in this game. I mean, some of these throws, the the play where he was rolling out of the pocket to his left and throwing to J.P. Richardson on the The sideline. The Richardson catch on the sideline. That was, man. As a a right-handed quarterback, that's a really, really difficult thing to do. Much like if you're a lefty and you're trying to roll out to the right and throw across your body, for, for him to be able to roll out of the pocket, see Richardson downfield, and I mean, this was like a 20-yard throw, and mm-hmm. he put it in the perfect spot. Any any further off, and that's probably an incomplete pass. And he was doing this all game long. And I think TCU's receivers, specifically Jalen Robinson and J.P. Richardson, deserve some credit. The way that they worked back to the football in this game, TCU's offensive line, as you said, did a tremendous job giving him a clean pocket to throw from. But Hoover was just he was making a lot of the right reads. The the two interceptions that he threw, the second one was not his fault by any means. He made a a pretty good throw that major Everhart needs to catch. He, he did, he dropped it and then it just landed in the hands of the defender. That's a tough break for, for Hoover. And then the first interception was a, a tough throw. He's trying to get it over two defenders. He gets it over the first one. And then the second one makes a really athletic play to basically catch the ball with one hand. And, and intercepted yeah, tip it to himself yeah yeah so a couple tough breaks there but overall just an outstanding performance I mean I, we're in the second quarter and TCU scores to go up 31 to 8 and I'm just kind of thinking to myself like is is this really happening right now like is this the same TCU team that didn't stand a chance against Iowa State and and blew a chance at victory against West Virginia I mean the team just seemed to come out with a entirely different energy in all three phases. And I think we can use this to transition into the next big takeaway, at least for me in this game. And that's the TCU defense was outstanding. I know we talked on the midweek episode about the key matchup between Keaton Slovis and this TCU secondary. And knowing this was Josh Hoover's first career start, the defense was going to have to step up and not only win this matchup, but they were going to have to make some big game changing plays. And first series of the game, I brought it up earlier. Shad banks comes on the delayed blitz and he doesn't get home, but he forces a bad decision by Keaton Slovis who came in with only three interceptions on the year, 10 touchdown passes over his last four games. And Miller Bradford sits on the, on the route and picks it off, returns it for a touchdown. And, Slovis, I think, was one of six or one of seven to to start the game. This BYU offense was just entirely out of sync. And the TCU secondary was outstanding, forcing Slovis to throw the ball away, forcing him to make difficult throws. At the end of the game, he was 15 of 34 for 152 yards, uh, zero touchdown passes, which hasn't happened for Slovis since week one this season. And we've talked about it before as well. Another game where TCU is forcing an opposing quarterback under 50% completions. Keaton Slovis finished at 44%. And you go back to week two when TCU beat nickel state, every quarterback since week two, with the exception of Rocco Becht, who was 16 to 28 has completed fewer than 50% of his passes. So that really speaks to how well this TCU secondary is playing right now. And then, I felt like TCU was having success really for the first time this year consistently with some of these delayed blitzes. We saw Jamoy Hodge come in on a blitz for a, for a big sack and a 10 yard loss Shad banks on the delayed blitz that forced the interception. I think Nambi Obi Izor had a sack as well. Mm -hmm. He continues to play outstanding football. And then the corner blitz, I think two weeks in a row, 
TCU has had a lot of success with that corner blitz. In this game, I believe it was Avery Helm mm-hmm. who came on a, on a corner blitz for a, for a sack, on a play that would make Gary Patterson proud. Um, this defense was just uh, tremendous. And LJ Martin, Miles Davis, the BYU rushing offense, it was held to about four yards a carry. And you'll take that all day when they're only throwing for 152 yards. So um, there really isn't anything I could complain about with the defensive performance, Anthony, what did you see from this defense on Saturday? Yeah, man, the, uh, everything worked for the defense on Saturday. <clears throat> These, whatever pressure looks that Joe Gillespie was drawing up was working like every time. Um, yeah. Jamoy Hodge, Shad Banks, uh, the corner blitzes, the, every opportunity to send somebody at Slovis was, making Slovis either see ghosts or get hit or get hurried and hassled. And, you know, it's something that that defense has missed the last couple of weeks um, is finding a way to, to actually get home on some of those, um, whether it was they were being sent too late or uh, there wasn't enough c- contain that the p- pocket broke down and they were able to, to sprint out of it. But this week it worked, and maybe some of that is uh, we underrated how much Slovis was a stand in the pocket statue quarterback. You know, mm-hmm. I, I thought maybe he would he had a little more wheels than that, and he didn't show anything. I mean, he was he was just standing back there getting crushed, and uh, TCU took full advantage of that, and and the the defensive front three was getting a lot of push as well. Um, Dominic Williams and Paul, Paul Oyewale were really pushing uh, that pocket. And whenever those blisters were coming in, I mean, that was it, it, as effective as that's been maybe in Joe Gillespie's time uh, as defensive coordinator. So really great job there. And then, yeah, the secondary, you know, Avery Helm dropped another interception or kind of had it knocked out of his hands. That would, that would have been a, a third turnover forced by this team. And um to go with uh, turnovers on downs. I mean, they did the three and out four, three and outs on the day. Um, And I think one or two more that were like four or five plays and punt, Um, you know, outside of the one drive that goes for 84 yards, everything else is a, is a pretty poor drive. Um, TCU did not allow anything to happen. And um, you know, I, I, kind of joked in our round table last week leading up to this game about the way you you don't allow BYU to be successful in the red zone is get them off the field and don't let them get in the red zone um, mm-hmm. because going into this game they were you know top 15 in the country at scoring points when they get to the red zone and and actually that that came to be really the case I mean TCU didn't let BYU get anything in this game just a, a really dominant performance defensively that um yeah harkens back to um you know Jerry Hughes knocking out Max Hall and uh, in back in 2008 um you know i think this B- BYU team is not very good and i think it's something as it, whenever we get to wrapping up on this it is like okay we're very excited about winning a game again finally and to feel like we're back on the right track, but there's some level of grain of salt that we have to take. Now, this is a BYU team that did go into Fayetteville and beat Arkansas on the road, an Arkansas team that gave Alabama fits this week. So, um, you know, they are capable, but this is, uh, TCU is going to see a lot better teams in the future coming up, especially starting this very next week. So. Um, I'm being a little bit cautious of getting too high on how everything went, but the performance this week was terrific from every phase. And I guess moving on to other phases, uh, Griffin Kell made his kicks, you know, mm-hmm. got his mojo back. I think um, he, I don't know if confidence had slipped uh, being in put in bad positions was not good, but um, you know, TCU wasn't, wholly successful in in everything it did and was forced to attempt 
uh, quite a few field goals and Griffin Kell converted those field goals. So, um, you know, make, making field goals, making extra points, uh, taking advantage of the opportunities you have. Um, uh, really, it's just an all around great performance from, from TCU. I think there are negatives. If we want to talk about negatives, we can probably get to that as well, but, um, I'll just say, you know, yeah, offense, defense, special teams, incredible job. Not to mention the partially blocked punt that TCU had, mm-hmm. I believe, toward the end of the the first half. TCU Nearly blocked a goal. few of them, yeah. Yep, and for, for Griffin Kell, it was nice to see him have a good bounce back game. He was three for three on field goals. He was five for five on extra points. And the, the keys really were the, number one, the protection was holding up. And number two, Griffin Kell wasn't being sent out there for a bunch of 50-plus yard field goals. He was put in some positions to make some – some some easier kicks and it was nice to see him bounce back and and make all of those cleanly. Uh for for me, I don't really think there were too many negatives. I mean, offensively, TCU did have two turnovers and struggled in some short yardage situations. I think about the third and one play where instead of running the football, TCU throws a short pass to Chase Curtis short of the line of scrimmage and he gets tackled for no gain. Uh, TCU goes for it on fourth and inches in the first half. And instead of running the football, you throw a seven yard slant to Jack Besh who drops the football. And unfortunately I think drops were, I guess for me, if there was a a big negative, it would be the drop passes. I think uh, Jojo Earl had a really bad drop over the middle. Jack Besh had a drop on that fourth down play. Dalen Wright had a difficult play on a throw over the shoulder where it looked like he had a good attempt on it, just kind of slipped through his hands. But the the drops have been a little bit of an issue. And I think in this game, if if some of those drops don't happen, Josh Hoover is looking at uh, 2021 Baylor Chandler Morris Mm -hmm. 500-yard performance. But um, I think collectively this was a a very good bounce-back win and a much-needed bounce back win for TCU. This was undoubtedly a must win game to get to four and three on the season and back to 500 at two and two in the big 12 conference and a a much more challenging opponent lies ahead for the frogs in Kansas state who just took down uh, Texas tech with a backup quarterback playing the majority of the, of the snap. So I guess the, the last question that I want to pose before we move on to some of the big 12 uh, recap stuff from over the weekend is for, for Josh Hoover, I know there's some talk now on social media, and I, I think this is just kind of the immediate reaction hot take. You know, th- this is two years in a row where Chandler Morris has won the starting job, two years in a row where he's gotten injured, and the backup quarterback has come in and just kind of stolen the show. Um, I'm not trying to look too far ahead. Of course, it's one game as happy as I was to see Josh Hoover play well, should Josh Hoover keep this up? And for all we know, he could go to Manhattan next week and, and really struggle, but should Josh Hoover continue to play really well? What does that mean for the future of this team at the quarterback position? Is there any, is there any world where Chandler Morris returns as the starter if Josh Hoover continues to play well. And I, I guess that's the question that I'll pose to you, Anthony. What are your thoughts on just yeah. what this performance by Josh Hoover means for the quarterback situation moving forward? I think it sets up to have that as a possibility. Um, you know, Hoover, if Hoover plays like this, yeah, I mean, there's there's nobody that you would you would put in in his place. I mean, uh, Chandler Morris, Caleb Williams, Tim Tebow, whatever. Um, so I, I don't, I don't think Hoover will keep it up. Not at this pace. Um, but if he's able to now take the reins here and, and go win a bunch of football games, um, Sonny Dykes, isn't going to take him out of the game. I, I, I don't think, I think the guy who's playing and playing well is going to continue to have the opportunities. I think we saw it um last year with Max Duggan. You know, Max comes you know, the Tarleton State game, he has a big game, but it's Tarleton State. SMU, um he has a pretty good game and they beat SMU and that's great. And then it's the Oklahoma game. 
and Mm -hmm. Max Duggan goes completely, uh, you know, nuclear mode on, on Oklahoma and that Brent Venables defense and, and it's over. There's no, there's no turning back from Max Duggan at that point. Um, And he, the rest is history. So if, if Josh Hoover goes into Manhattan and puts up five touchdowns on the Wildcats and TCU comes away with the big win, it's going to be very hard to look back from mm-hmm. Josh Hoover as the quarterback. Um, if he goes there and does like Chandler Morris after his big debut against Baylor in 2021, follows it up with a, a big time clunker against a, you know, similarly or better team um, on the road against Oklahoma state uh, and, and has a pretty terrible game. Um, if, if Hoover goes to Manhattan and is terrible, then you're probably talking about if Chandler is healthy, he steps back into the role. So I think this game didn't decide it. I think it'll continue to be a question going forward, but what this has done is put Hoover into having that conversation. I think before this, it's probably not a conversation. And, you know, the other question that's been talked about a lot is, uh, you know, is, is Sonny Dykes just bad at evaluating quarterbacks? Um, I don't think that's the case. I think that Chandler Morris is a very, very good practice quarterback and he shows it on the field in practice better than the other guys in the room. Um, but it hasn't shown up on the field consistently enough uh, to to give the wins, to give Frog fans kind of that comfort of knowing, all right, we're we're safe in in Chandler's hands here. Uh, we're going to go make something happen. So, you know, I, I think we've we've said a lot of great things about Josh Hoover, and none of that here is to take away from Chandler Morris. I think a lot of people have taken this opportunity to to beat down on Chandler Morris, and I think that's ridiculous. I think Chandler is still a very good quarterback. He just, he may have something about when it comes to the bright lights of the game time, it just doesn't click for him as much. So I, you know, I I think we'll see how the rest of it plays out. Um, You know, the other thing I'll say on it is to, to give some credit where I've previously not given credit. I think that the offensive game plan here was uh, well-conceived and and so kudos to the offensive coordinator for keeping it simple for Josh Hoover. You know, there there weren't a lot of I think he did all of the easy stuff really well. He did the hard stuff really well also. Um like you said that the progression on the Warren Thompson touchdown, some of these passes were just incredible. But I think a lot of the accumulation of stats and the accumulation of confidence was <clears throat> BYU is giving all of this space and the mm-hmm. TCU wide receivers were able to run these easy routes. We're talking about slant routes for eight yards with nobody even close to them. Um, you know, comebacks, uh, go routes, Jordan Bailey uh, showing off his speed on a go route where he just burns the defensive back, not even close. Um, you know, I think that some of that is your skill outclasses BYU by quite a bit, but some of it is, you just set up for easy, take what they're giving you. If they're going to give you eight yards, every play, go throw the ball around the yard for eight yards, every play. So, um, yeah, I guess that's my thought on, on Hoover going forward. Mm -hmm. 584 total yards for the TCU offense. And a, a subset of Josh Hoover's big day was that the wide receiver room just went off. I think in total there were 13 different TCU players that caught at least one pass. You had JP Richardson catch six passes for 104 yards and a touchdown. Savion Williams had six catches, I think for 77 yards. Jalen Robinson, seven catches for 68 yards. It was great to have him back. He had a couple key grabs in this game. Jared Wiley was effective in the red zone once again. Jordan Jordan Bailey I'm not sure if they're trying to protect his red shirt, but I think we need to see a little more Jordan Bailey and a little more Cam Cook moving forward. I know those are those are really talented freshmen that you, you kind of want to preserve their 
their red shirt. I'm not sure if Cam Cooks is still preserved at this point because he's played in, in a few games. I'm not he's sure. Seen if he's seen some over. action for sure. Yeah. He, he's seen some action. And, and to be quite honest, part of me thinks that he's shown a little more than Trey Sanders. And I'm not trying to be too much of a Debbie Downer, but I, I like what I've seen from Cam Cook in some of these limited settings. And then Jordan Bailey, I've seen more from Jordan Bailey on the offensive side of the ball this year than I've seen from Jojo Earl and mm-hmm. Major Everhart combined. I mean, I, I just feel like he's he's been the best player in some of those gadget-type situations, some of those touch passes and the jet sweeps behind the line of scrimmage, and, and he's made big plays happen. So I think maybe you need to find a way to get him involved a little bit more. You know, the wide receiver room, it looks pretty clear at this point that J.P. Richardson, Savion Williams, and Jalen Robinson are the the top three guys. You, know, you sprinkle in a little bit of Dalen Wright, a little bit of uh, of Jared Wiley, a little bit of hopefully Jordan Bailey, and, and this TCU passing attack is starting to look really dynamic and really deep, and we'll see if TCU can continue to keep that up next weekend when the Frogs go to Manhattan for a big game against Kansas State. And that'll be TCU's last game before the bye week. So with that, I guess we'll go ahead and transition into our our brief recap here of the Big 12 results from week seven of the college football season. A crazy game between Houston and West Virginia. West Virginia on fourth down throws a 50-yard touchdown pass to take the lead with, I think, less than 20 seconds left in the game. And then Houston comes right back on a Hail Mary from Donovan Smith wins the game as time expires 41 to 39 the final score there as dana holgerson and the cougars take down the mountaineers we had iowa state winning big on the road against cincinnati i thought the the bearcats would put up a little bit more of a fight there but cincinnati losing iowa state winning 30 to 10 the final there Uh, a, a big upset between Oklahoma State and Kansas for the second week in a row, I think I picked Oklahoma State to win as the home underdog. And Kansas came in as a top 25 team, ranked 23rd in the country. This was a big shootout. Jason Bean, Alan Bowman both played really well, but it was the Cowboys that came out on top 39 to 32. And then the nightcap between Kansas State and Texas Tech, uh, Will Howard got injured in this game. Avery Johnson, the four star freshman, Backup comes in. He just, you know, runs for five touchdowns and casual the Wildcats cruise over the Red Raiders 38 to 21. So, Anthony, you look at these results. What kind of stands out to you the most about what you saw from these big 12 teams over the weekend? Man, a, a couple things. The first thing is, how did TCU lose to West Virginia and to Colorado? Seeing how Colorado, the way Colorado lost uh to Stanford this week as well. Man, it's just it's one of those like you look back, ah man, a little bit of a little bit of regret there that TCU lost those games. Um but man that that Houston game was so fun. You know, Dana Holgerson kind of getting that little bit of revenge. You could see his face, just the like the life drain out of his face as they they show him on the sideline after that touchdown. But um you know, Green gets the gets the penalty, the unsportsmanlike penalty after that touchdown. He takes off his helmet on the field. He's waving at the fans uh, mm-hmm. there in Houston, and um, you know, they're the the Mountaineers are all celebrating. And that penalty ended up, I, I think, being pretty huge. You know, I don't know that Houston <clears throat> picks up enough yards to even have a chance at a, a hail mary like that if if you don't get those extra fifteen yards. So, uh. You know, I I don't know how much that, I, you know, going into this game, West Virginia was one of the teams looking like, they, I mean, they controlled their own destiny. They had this pretty clear path with maybe one challenging game. Um, and turns out they lose this one. So I think it, it, it now sets up pretty difficult for them to uh, keep moving forward, but we'll see what happens there. The other, I mean, Kansas State with Avery Johnson um, is, it's it's pretty interesting. I mean, as a true freshman coming in, but this was a big time recruit. I mean, he was a, a high four star. Um, and you know, it was the kind of thing of like, can Kansas State keep this guy? Is he gonna stay with with the Wildcats? 
is he going to go try and find a bigger program or something? And, and they, you know, similar to the way, um, Austin Novosad went from Baylor to, to Oregon kind of at the last minute. Um, and they do hang on to him and it's like, man, he's going to be really good. This, this sucks. Cause he's going to be great. Uh, and he was super great in his first, his first look here. I mean, four rushing touchdowns, I think that's, I mean, uh, you got to hats off to him and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, we're not previewing yet, but I'm of, of different minds of like, do you want to have to face Will Howard, the, the horn frog killer, or do you want to have to face this, uh, you know, superstar four-star freshman, uh, for Kansas state? So I think they released a depth chart where they're both listed as co-starters. So, uh, they're keeping it close to the vest to see who's going to actually be the starter for TCU next week. But, um, yeah, you know, Kansas, they kind of fell on their face. Cincinnati fell on their face. I think that those are unfortunate, but, um, the, those two games, the the weeknight game and the late night game, were were sure exciting to watch. Uh, watch take place. I know we've bantered on the podcast a little bit over the last few weeks about the the Big Twelve power rankings and where some of these teams stand. And West Virginia was the the team that we were jokingly putting all of our hopes on to challenge mm-hmm. Oklahoma and Texas to make some miracle run and find their way to the championship game. And uh, I'm not sure if that's really the case anymore with the Mountaineers losing to to Houston. But on the subject of the power rankings, for me, I was really disappointed with Cincinnati in this game against Iowa State. I thought this was uh, you're playing at home and you're looking for a Big 12 win against a, a decent Iowa State team. And your offense is just really struggling right now. And I think Cincinnati, with Houston winning this game, I think Cincinnati right now has secured its place as the bottom feeder of the of the conference right now and maybe that'll change over the second half of the season but this team has just you know really struggled so uh Oklahoma State continues to to prove people wrong home underdog again Mike Gundy does not lose games at home as the underdog and it appears that the three quarterback strategy has finally gone to the wayside and Alan Bowman appears to be the the quarterback that they're rolling with. And Ollie Gordon had an unbelievable game in this one for the Cowboys. I think he had about 250 or so total yards. He was just dominating the Jayhawks in, in the run game and in the pass game. So a big, big win there for Oklahoma state. And then yeah, Kansas state it's, it's going to be a challenge to to stop whoever they throw out at quarterback next week. Part of me, you know, we're not going to get too much into preview because we'll have that in our our midweek. But uh, considering the how the Adrian Martinez and Will Howard matchups went last year, part of me wonders maybe let the the freshman go out there and try and run it a little bit and see if he can crack this TCU defense. But we will see what happens ultimately next weekend when TCU goes on the road to take on Kansas State. Before the bye week, that I think will do it for all of our football discussion this evening. We do have some more TCU items to hit on. We'll start with TCU soccer. Uh, picking up a big win yesterday over Baylor. Final score one to zero. Second to last match of the regular season. TCU got a goal in the first half on a penalty kick from AJ Hennessy. Uh, an important win for TCU after a disappointing result on Thursday where the Frogs were at home against Houston, had a 2-0 lead in the first half and gave up two goals over the middle part of the second half and settled for a 2-2 draw against Houston uh, after goals from Gracie Bryan and seven Castaigne. So TCU soccer now 10-4-3 overall this season, 6-1-2 in the Big 12. Final match of the conference schedule is going to be next Monday against Texas that'll be in Austin and then we will have the conference tournament where TCU is looking to secure a top 2 seed. Anthony, what are your chances what are the the chances that TCU can secure one of these top seeds in the in the conference tournament after these results against the Cougars <laughs> and against the Bears? I think you really needed to win both of these games. I mean, losing that game or <laughs> losing. See, it was a draw. It was a draw. <laughs> they drew with Houston. It was not a loss. I, it felt, man, felt like I, a loss. I, it, I, and I even said that in, in my recap of it. it. It felt like a loss, but 
drawing that game with Houston is is not good enough. Um, oh, sorry, I've got oh, man, I'm, I've got a cough going here. But um, yeah, I think that uh, it's going to be tough for TCU to hold on to that number two seed because they only have the one game left. They're only three points clear of BYU, who has two games left. And the the trip to Austin is a very tough game. I mean, if you come out of that with a draw, even you, you're probably feeling okay. Um, but I think you you're entering that situation where BYU can go get two wins and secure the. You you've now left that door open uh, for the Cougars. So I, I think that uh, it's just unfortunate to have that draw because you could have gone and, and completely locked up that two seed, uh, which I believe gives you a buy in the, in the big 12 tournament. Um, so now, you know, TCU could certainly go to Texas, go get a win in Texas and maybe, um, and that, that closes the door. Um, and, or at least I, I guess it would have to go to tiebreakers or something at that point, because TCU and BYU drew and it's possible they could still tie on points. Anyway, um, yeah, getting that draw was tough because you go up to nothing, you go into halftime, you're completely controlling this game. Houston only gets two shots on goal the whole game and they both go in. Um, mm-hmm. and one of them was like from, I, I don't know, probably 35 yards, uh, pretty deep outside the box, just kind of a, a, a boot in and just perfectly on target, a true freshman for Houston, um, who's local here to DFW, uh, probably wish that she had come to Fort Worth instead of down to Houston. But um, in the in the Baylor game, the big thing here was, yeah, very physical game, lots of fouls between these two teams. But uh, the key play being the earned penalty kick, which was conceded by former Horn Frog Tyler Isgrig, who... Uh, transferred to Baylor from TCU after last season. This is our first season at Baylor. So I think that um, there was some disappointment that that she left, at least, you know, I, for me, I thought she was a really uh, strong offensive player and uh, had a lot of really good things on on corner kicks and, and set pieces and stuff. And so TCU was missing that a lot this season, but a, a little bit of poetic justice for her to give away the the penalty and and AJ Hennessy to convert that and give TCU the win. And we'll see if TCU can go on the road next week and get that big win at Austin. Elsewhere, TCU volleyball was on the road this past week for a couple of matches. I know we talked about it briefly on the big week, the Oklahoma match from Wednesday. TCU rallied from a 2-0 deficit. Audrey Knowles, all Big 12 preseason player, had two huge plays in the final stage of the third set where she had a a big block and a kill on two consecutive points to secure that third set 29-27 and then TCU took the fourth and fifth sets to reverse sweep the Sooners 3-2. Oklahoma was coming in without a conference win this season but TCU did play the final two sets without Melanie Parra who's been the outstanding outside hitter transfer in from Texas. She's had Several huge matches for the Frogs this year with kill counts in the 20s, even a couple matches in the in the 30s. But I think there may have been a little bit of an injury there in the Oklahoma match because Melanie Parra did not play hmm. in the West Virginia match yesterday. Uh, TCU did get big games, however, from Audrey Nalls and Taylor Riola, the sister of Dylan Riola, the number one high school quarterback in the country right now. She had 17 kills and 21 digs for a double-double. Audrey Nalls had 22 kills, which I believe was a season high for her, 18 digs as well. TCU coming up just a little bit short, though, in this match. I think if you have Melanie Parra, you probably win this match, and you probably win the Oklahoma match a little more handily. But uh, a tough 3-2 loss to West Virginia Yesterday, Cecily Bramschreiber had 28 digs, which was a season high. Lily Nicholson, the freshman setter, and Riley Buckley, they combined for 59 assists. There were some marathon sets in this match. TCU took the first set 30-28, to and then West Virginia's second set win was 34-32. to So there were some 
Uh, these girls are probably pretty tired after the first two sets. That's a lot of volleyball being played in a, in a five set match, especially. So uh, TCU will look to bounce back this week, 12 and seven overall on the season, five and three in the conference. But one thing to know, TCU did have 22 blocks in the match against Oklahoma on Wednesday. That's the most that any Big 12 team has had in a match this year, and it's the third most in a match for any TCU team in program history. So a, a shout-out to the defense there, the, the girls on the front line, Bree Green, Sarah Sylvester, Audrey Nalls doing a phenomenal job of, of sending those shots back and, and playing great defense. Big matches coming up, though, for, for TCU Volleyball. If y'all are in the area, go to Shellmeyer Arena. Wednesday and Sunday, TCU is going to be hosting Texas on Wednesday, the number seven team in the country, and Kansas on Sunday, the number 16 team in the country. So TCU is going to be looking to, to secure a big win there to try and give that NCAA tournament resume a little bit of a boost. Anthony, I think that's everything we got this evening. Any final thoughts here before we go ahead and wrap up for the night? Yeah, just taking a peek over at Monday Night Football, seeing, you know, there's some frogs in play there. Not a lot of statistics, but um, some kick returns. You know, you've got Cavante Turpin on one side, Darius Davis on the other side. So Turpin's had a 21-yard return. Davis has had a 26-yard return. No receptions yet for uh, our man, Quentin Johnston. So hopefully Justin Herbert, can uh, can figure out where he is on the field and, and get him the ball sometime soon. Yeah, you, you really like to see Quentin <clears throat> Johnson get it going here. It feels like he's been very quiet and without Mike Even Williams. Even with Mike Williams, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Mike, Mike Williams out for the year with that ACL injury and Joshua Palmer coming in bang, uh, banged up as well. Would really like to see QJ get it going here at some point. And also shout out to Trayvon Merrick, had another interception uh, over the weekend, picked off a ball that was uh, thrown right to him by Mac Jones, who's just uh, a disaster right now at the quarterback <laughs> position right now for for New England. And if y'all haven't kept up with the TCU players that are active in the NFL right now, check out our website, frogsofwar.com. We have the latest updates there. And for football and soccer and volleyball and every other TCU sport, continue to follow us online at frogsofwar.com. Continue to follow us on Facebook and Twitter as well at Frogs of War. This episode, of course, brought to you by our friends at Charlie Hustle Clothing Company. Charlie Hustle, vintage made fresh. Go to charliehustle.com. Get your TCU swag. I got my Charlie Hustle TCU shirt on right now. Use the promo code Frogs of War. Get 15% off all TCU items or use the promo code 10 12 15 T-E-N-1215 for 15% off any non-sale items. CharlieHustle.com. Check that out. Support the Patreon 1012 Network if y'all would like to support the two of us here at Frogs Up or any of the other podcasts involved with the 1012 Network. Go to Patreon.com forward slash 1012 Network. I am Russ Hodges. That is Anthony North. That will do it for our weekend episode. We will be back here in a few days to preview the Kansas State game and give you the latest and greatest in TCU sports once again, and we will sign off with a frogs up frogs up. <laughs>